get too deep into the woods of weeds about um, specific things, but hopefully this will be helpful for in-service exams, and hopefully it'll also be helpful for just in general when you see a child with a head and neck mask, thinking through the process of working them up. I don't have any disclosures. So initially, when you see a child with a neck mask, it's good to have sort of a, a cohesive process to think through this. And the way I like to break this down is to whether it's a congenital mask, meaning has it been there, or is it likely to have been there since birth, or is it more likely to be acquired? And in both situations, location can be helpful. So in congenital neck masses, midline masses will give you clues to certain differential diagnoses, and lateral neck masses will give you clues to different diagnoses. Um, in acquired neck masses, again, and location can be helpful. Is it lateral or is it bilateral? Um, occasionally, you'll see midline neck masses as well that are acquired. Um, associated factors are definitely useful. So getting a good history, finding out about symptoms, and are there skin changes? Does it change with infection? Does it get bigger or smaller? Is there a sinus tract that drains or swells up? Um, do they have any fever with it or pain? Do they have any weight loss or bruising or night sweats, you know, the B-type symptoms? Um, is there associated dysphagia that might lead you toward an infectious, infectious etiology? And then change over time. Does it fluctuate in size? Is there swelling? Does the swelling continue or um, persist? Is there a change in texture over time? And then timing of intervention, when to do when to consider other interventions such as surgery or other medical management. Um, in general, benign processes are much more common in pediatric patients. So you can see malignancies, and we'll talk about some of those, but generally you're going to think more in the benign process. Um, infectious etiologies are also most likely, or congenital etiologies. One thing to bear in mind is that congenital neck masses may not present until the teenage years, or early 20s. So they don't always present as a small child or during infancy. And family history can be helpful in these cases. For example, if there's a family history of hearing loss or if the child the neck mass and also failed newborn hearing screen, you may be thinking in, in terms of something like branchio-otorenal syndrome. So we'll talk about congenital neck masses first, and then we'll go into more of the acquired neck masses. And these are the ones we'll talk about, branchial cleft, thyroglossal duct cyst. Uh, we'll touch on dermoids, midline cervical cleft, and vascular malformation. In terms of the evaluation workup, it's similar for uh, whether it's a congenital or an acquired neck mass. Um, ultrasound is generally very beneficial. It's non-invasive child doesn't have to be sedated to do it, and it can give you an idea of whether there's a cystic component, a solid component, a mixed component, vascular flow, um, so you can get a lot of information out of an ultrasound. Depending on the mass itself and the location and the concern, you may want to get a CT scan with contrast or an MRI scan, and in some cases, tissue sampling may be beneficial unless it's pulsatile. Obviously, you don't want to uh, biopsy an AVM or a, a hemangioma. Um, in specific cases, you may consider excisional biopsy if you're concerned about uh, lymphoma or post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. Um, in other cases, excision is the management and treatment. So the midline congenital ma neck masses are generally thyroglossal duct cysts, which are the most common, and frequently ultrasound can help differentiate between thyroglossal duct cysts and dermoid cysts. Um, Occasionally, people will do other imaging, such as CT scans, uh, just to confirm that. The other thing you really want to make sure is that there is present normal thyroid tissue. In rare cases, a thyroglossal duct cyst or a lingual thyroid will be the only thyroid tissue the child has, and then that patient will end up with permanent hypothyroidism. So not as common in thyroglossal duct cysts as in lingual thyroids, but still it's beneficial if you're already going to image it, make sure they look at the thyroid gland itself too. Dermoids are also present in the midline. Frequently, they're seen more in the nasal area, uh, but they can present anywhere from the frontal process down to the sternal notch. Uh, they definitely uh, can be confused with thyroglossal duct cysts when they're in the superior neck at the level of the thyroid cartilage or hyoid bone. Um, sometimes they're a little bit more rubbery to uh, touch, uh, but they can be difficult to identify or differentiate. The ultrasound may be helpful because dermoids tend to be a little bit more solid. Um, and when you do do surgery for them, 
you won't necessarily see any kind of a tract. They tend to just be under the um, subcutaneous tissue and then just end as opposed to with autoglossal duct cysts, which fortunately, frequently, you will see a tract at least to the hyoid. Once we get past the hyoid up to the tongue base, then the tract tends to arborize and can be a little more challenging. Midline cervical clefts are kind of an interesting entity. They can present as a mass, but frequently they present as a thick tract, and I have a picture of one to show you, or a draining fistula, um, generally around the level of the thyroid cartilage, extending down toward the sternal notch. The thyroglossal duct cysts, as you all know, occur as the thyroid descends from the foramen cecum in the back of the tongue down to the first tracheal ring and they're usually located somewhere between the cricoid and the hyoid. They can occur above the hyoid, and that's where you can run into difficulty identifying the tract. Those tend to have a higher recurrence rate because, again, it's difficult to find the tract, and the tract can be arborized. So even when you think you, there's still some sitting back there. They generally terminate in the base of the tongue, and the procedure of choice is a cyst trunk procedure where you resect the mid portion of the hyoid. The reported recurrence rate after a cyst trunk is 5 to 20 percent. Um, if the mid portion of the hyoid is not resected, it's a much higher recurrence rate, about 60 percent. And like I said earlier, you want to use ultrasound to determine the presence of a normal thyroid. Um, a lot of people will follow up past the hyoid bone um, to where the muscle uh, changes in its appearance from the thick tongue muscle to more the appearance of almost pharyngeal muscle and then uh, suture ligate at that level to decrease the likelihood of recurrence. Um, for the most part, the finding the track up through the highway bone is not as difficult, um, but if you don't take out the highway, as you can see that the recurrence rate is quite high. And this is, image shows the thyroglossal duct cyst. This is a CT scan done here, um, right at the left, and here you can see it as well. They can present at any age. Sometimes you'll see them in young infants, and they may show up in teenage years. Usually, people will wait to resect them until the kids are a little bit older, um, but if you wait too long, they have a high likelihood of getting infected, and when they're infected, they're a little more difficult to deal with, and tissue claims tend to be not as easy to see. Dermoid cysts um, occur in a similar location to thyroglossal duct cysts. They usually have solid and cystic components on the ultrasound. They often will present with a small little puncta or a little tuft of hair that protrude through the skin. Again, frequently you'll see them nasally and you'll want to image those to make sure there's not an intracranial component. Um, again, they can be difficult to differentiate between thyroglossal duct cysts, um, but usually they're going to end right above the level of the muscles and not track up toward the hyoid bone. Um, and they're comprised of epidermal and adnexal structures like hair or sebaceous glands on pathology. They have a much lower rate of recurrence. Midline cervical cleft, this is an image of one here, and you can sort of see this really thick cord. It almost looks like mucosa here, and it's sort of tethering just below this, uh, the mandible toward the sternal notch here. And this can actually cause restriction of the of growth of the neck and the mandible over time. And it's due to failure of fusion between the first and second branchial arches. The way these are removed is using a Z-plasty, a double Z-plasty, so you reorient the scar um, horizontally instead of vertically, and that allows for better growth. So laterally, we see quite a few different types of neck masses, but the most common are branchial cleft cysts. Um, they can present as cysts or pits or sinus tracts or fistula tracts. Um, and the most common ones are the second and third branchial cleft cysts or fistula tracts. The location is anterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and then they terminate in the pharynx, which is why they can drain. Um, the second branchial cleft cyst will terminate in the tonsil, and third and fourth will terminate in the piriform sinus. Um, first branchial cleft cysts, which aren't in the neck, but the type 2 can end at the submandibular or the mandibular angle, um, start in the ear usually. Um, also, hemangiomas and lymphatic Lymphatic malformations will present in the anterior triangle, but frequently they can occur anywhere in the neck. So they may be midline, they may be bilateral, and you'll see a lot of pictures of those. 
Uh, the branchial cleft cysts are derived from the pharyngeal pouches. The first arch is um, the ear and the external canal, and they will present as a reduplicated external auditory canal. Um, sometimes they will follow the seventh nerve all the way into the parotid, and in type two, they'll end below the angle of the mandible. So they tend to be um, associated with the facial nerve, and the resection of these often involves uh, superficial or partial parotidectomy and nerve dissection. The second branchial cleftus go between the internal and external carotid artery and above cranial nerves 9 and 12 and end to enter the tonsillar fossa. And third branchial cleftus track behind the internal and external carotid artery and then run between the ninth and 12th nerve into the piriform sinus. This is a really useful table, and it came out of a, a book, Embryology of the Neck, in 1997, but it shows you what the different arches are and what their skeletal derivatives are, what their nerves are, what their feeding arteries are, and kind of the pouch or derivative. And so this is helpful, especially for um, board exams or in-service exams. Um, so you can see here, second as associated with the hyoid. It forms the stapes and the stylohyoid ligament. Um, it's associated with the facial nerve, and then it goes to the tonsil. Third is associated with the glossopharyngeal arch um, and the greater cornea of the hyoid bone, and follows the inferior parathyroid and the thymus. And then fourth is associated with the thyroid and the laryngeal cartilages. So this chart, I feel like, is a very useful um, reference. Here you can see the track of the second and third uh, branchial cleft cyst and sinus tract. So here's the second one. Here's the cyst here. Like I said, it can sometimes just terminate into a little pit or form a draining sinus tract. And you can see it follow between the internal and external carotid and go over 9 and 12 here into the tonsil. In some cases, in somebody who has kind of a long neck you may and a long tract, you may end up having to do a stair step incision to track it all the way up and resect the whole thing. The third branchial cleftus here you can see goes behind the vessels and then between 9 and 12 here. Frequently you don't actually see 9, you can just find where these things terminate and then suture ligate them here. Um, one of the things that I find really helpful to do when we're do removing the sinus tracts especially is to squirt a little bit of methylene blue in it. I use an angiocath, like a 24 gauge angiocath with about a cc of methylene blue, and I cannulate the duct or the puncta and squirt the methylene blue in it, and it'll follow the tract all the way up and make it really easy to see it um, so you can dissect it out. And I had one kid when they were, they were using an LMA to do this, um, when they took the LMA, some blue on the LMA from where the methylene blue had gone into the pharynx, so that was kind of interesting. Um, but those can really be very, that can be a useful trick because sometimes these tracks are not the easiest to find, especially as they continue up and around. And here's a CT scan imaging of the, um, the second branchial cleftus and the third, and you can see the level where they end. So here this is around the tonsil, and here this is more at the level of the piriform sinus. There's the thyroid cartilage and the vocal folds right here, and the posterior part of the pharynx here, and you can see the cystic lesion here, sternocleidomastoid muscle muscles back over here. Fourth branchial cliffs are um, rare. I have seen a few, annoying actually, um, but they also open into the piriform sinus, and they run between the um, superior and recurrent laryngeal nerve. They're always involved with the thyroid gland. So frequently you will end up doing a hemithyroidectomy or a thyroid lobectomy to remove the cyst and the tract. Um, so here you can see the cyst here, and it kind of flips over around the, between the um, internal and external carotid artery and over 12, and then comes back around. And it doesn't always go back under the arch of the aorta, but usually it tracks up toward the thyroid gland over here. And here you can see the cyst, and here's the thyroid on the um, left-hand side. Here's the right side. Here's some more of the cyst. This one was really big. Um, it actually had a pretty big opening into the piriform sinus. We had um, our GI colleagues do a flexible esophagoscopy so we could actually see where the top of it was. Um, we were resecting all of this. And here you can see it on the coronal view here. 
So um, vascular malformations are interesting. They can occur anywhere in the head and neck area, um, oftentimes unilateral, and, but they can be bilateral and diffuse, and they can cause airway compromise. So that patients end up needing a tracheostomy and gastrostomy feeding tube. Um, they're characterized by histologic type and growth pattern. Um, frequent ones you'll see in younger children or babies or hemangiomas, uh, but lymphatic and venolymphatic malformations can present kind of any time during infancy and childhood. Hemangiomas might be present at birth, but frequently will present a few weeks to months after. Um, the congenital type will be either rapidly involuting, and there, if you test them uh, pathologically positive for GLUT1, or they may be non-involuting. The more common are infantile types, so they show up uh, a little bit after birth, they go through a growth phase or a proliferative phase, and then they slowly involute. One of the game changers recently has been the um, use of propranolol, which has really um, improved the involution of these things and in resolution of them in some cases as well. Um, imaging isn't always needed, but depending on how big it is and where it's located and right with contrast would be what you would want to do. Um, and about 10% of cutaneous hemangiomas will have some airway hemangioma association. So it's something to kind of keep in mind, especially if the baby has strider, you want to look and see is there any kind of um, subglottic component. So this is a, a hemangioma here. In this picture, it looks more like a, a cystic lesion or like lymphatic malformation. It's very bright and it's involving the parotid gland and the buccal fat here. And this one actually did respond quite well to propranolol and um, almost completely resolved over time. Here's another one that had, uh, was treated with propranolol and you can see there was a uh, cutaneous component. And there was also a subcutaneous component here. There's some more on the neck here. And then this is about three months after propranolol treatment and you could already see a big improvement in the size and the um, distribution of it. Lymphovascular lesions often have been referred to as cystic hygromas. That's sort of the older terminology. They may be present in, at birth and they usually will grow with a child. When child gets sick with an upper respiratory infection, frequently they will swell up. They may go back down to their original size or they may stay enlarged. Um, they're generally treated with a combination of things, either sclerotherapy or surgical excision or both. With sclerotherapy, usually they'll need more than one um, application. And some of the common agents that are used are um, alcohol, bleomycin, doxycycline, OK432. Um, so there's several different agents that are used for sclerotherapy. Serolimus and sildenafil have also been useful agents for management of uh, lymphovascular lesions. So we'll have several patients that are on serolimus for quite a while. Um, sildenafil has had, had some mixed results. So some patients responded very well with it, whereas others don't. Um, the terminology is often um, confusing because People will talk about them being macrocystic or microcystic or combination, but that's actually beneficial and you'll see that on imaging because macrocystic lesions will respond much better to sclerotherapy, whereas microcystic lesions won't. And the way I like to think about these is like bubble paper. So you have bubble paper with the big, huge popping bubbles and those kind of are easy to do and then you have the, the small bubble paper and those are harder to think about the way sclerotherapy works. So what's done under uh, radiology guidance usually. Um, the radiologist or interventional, interventionalist will needle aspirate the fluid that's in the cyst, then inject the sclerosing agent, then aspirate it back out. So if you have a big cystic component, that makes it very easy. But if you have multiple little cystic components, it's a little difficult sometimes to break them up and sort of make them one big coalescent. Um, the other thing that's very interesting is these things are uh, reactive during hormonal changes like puberty. So frequently we'll see changes in vascular malformations during puberty. Um, oftentimes they get bigger, but sometimes they just change in their quality. They may become more venous and maybe more susceptible to bleeding. Um, so often need to be managed. So I follow these patients for years. Um, this is a picture of a macrocystic lymphatic malformation here. This one was actually managed 
with sclerotherapy first followed by surgery. And here you can see it's pretty superficial. Um, the parents wanted to try sclerotherapy first. She could have just been done surgically as well. Um, but she recurred and then they opted for surgery. This one is huge, as you can see here. This baby was managed with sclerotherapy twice and then we did surgery on her. And now we just monitor her to make sure she doesn't have any recurrence. She had a little tiny bit that it tracked just under the um, clavicle. This was done in combination with pediatric surgery because it tracked into the mediastinum. Um, so that's the piece that we have been monitoring and so far she's been doing really well. She's about three years old now. So moving away from congenital neck masses, we'll talk about some acquired neck masses, and these are things that you'll see very commonly. Um, the most common is just lymphadenopathy. Most of the time it's infectious and it's just reaction to some kind of viral infection or bacteria, but occasionally they can be malignant, so that's something to keep in mind. We'll briefly talk about thyroid disease and other malignancies. So in, chin, in children, the lymph nodes are typically palpable and they will get relatively big. So just because you see a child that has multiple lymph nodes, generally there's no reason to get too upset about it. Parents will freak out and most of the time it's because they've had an ear infection or a sinus infection or an upper respiratory type infection um, and they'll be self-limiting and over time they'll resolve. But generally they'll take a much longer time to resolve than the um, concomitant illness does. Um, so we'll see them stay enlarged for months. And the times we get concerned about it is if they're continuing to enlarge or they're changing their care. On ultrasound, you'll see normal architecture with a fatty hilum. Um, you may see multiple nodes kind of next to each other here, here, here. Um, they can occur at any age. And oftentimes you'll get a history of some fever or some arthralgias or malaise. Um, in some cases, there will be overlying cellulitis or erythema of the skin, uh, and they can have multiple sites. They may require antibiotics, but they can also become abscessed, especially retropharyngeal and parapharyngeal nodes, and that's where we get our abscesses that we have to deal with. Um, and they may require IV antibiotics or surgical drainage. It's important to get the history. So you wanna know about travel or insect bites, or if there's any cats in the home, if there's anybody that's been exposed to TB, um, if there's a history of strep throat, mono is quite common, and we'll see that in preteens and teenagers more commonly than younger children, um, and rarely HIV exposure. One of the things that's interesting that we will see uh, present with uh, significant adenopathy is uh, atypical mycobacterium or tuberculosis. They'll show a necrotic adenopathy. The majority of these are either uh, MAC, mycobacterium avium complex, or MAI, um, with the oral cavity being the point of entry, either because of dental procedures or just because kids put their fingers in their mouth before washing their hands. Um, but there's a lot of different ways they can kind of enter into the oral cavity and then they travel to the cervical lymph node. Um, in adults, these are usually tuberculosis, so you want to put them in isolation and get your IV colleague involved. Um, they will stain for acid fast bacilli. Uh, in children, the PPD might be negative. We will usually ask for PPD, and then the um, quintiferon may be equivocal. Sometimes it will be positive. I have had a couple of kids where they actually did come up with tuberculosis, but the majority just are gonna be MAC or MAI. Surgery is usually the treatment for atypical mycobacterium, but for TB or for significant disseminated uh, these or multiple nodes, uh, the infectious disease team will treat with uh, anti-TB medication. Um, and generally, we won't do natal aspiration on these. We will actually do surgical excision. So this is a patient that had a enlarging uh, conglomeration of nodes and actually had quite a lot of purulence in there. To come to the OR, we resected about a four and a half centimeter node and got about 30 cc's of pus out. And his is um, atypical myco and he's getting um, three drug therapy per infectious disease right now. Cat scratch is um, not as common. It usually does occur in children as opposed to adults. Um, at last report, there are about 22,000 cases a year that are in the United States. 
the organism is Bartonella henselii, and it causes a regional cervical adenitis. And usually there's like a little um, superficial skin lesion that you'll see where the inoculation site is. Um, you can actually get an inoculation site in the eye and it'll form this oculoglandular syndrome where you get uh, pretty significant conjunctivitis. In some severe cases, you'll actually have osteomyelitis or encephalitis, so it's not a completely benign infection. It is usually self-limiting. It can be treated with fluoroquinolones or with um, Bactrim slash Septra. Um, so we don't see this very often, but we always think about it, and especially when we see kids with multiple nodes and then a small like skin area that may look a little bit like impetigo. Toxoplasmosis is also um, relatively common, but we don't actually see it that often in children. Uh, it's found in cat feces and undercooked pork. Uh, these patients will present with flu-like symptoms and generalized adenopathy. And in severe cases, they also can develop encephalitis um, or conjunctivitis. It can be passed on to the fetus. Uh, in a long time ago, they used to test for this, do torch titers. Apparently, that's not really done so much anymore. Um, and then the treatment is a multi-combination of uh, sulfonamide and uh, pyrithiamine. Other pathology that is benign that can present in the neck are things like lipomas, um, epidermal inclusion cysts, in some cases, pilomatricomas, but those tend to be more in the face than in the neck. Uh, it's helpful to think about sarcoidosis, especially if there's a family history. Castleman disease, which is not super common, but it'll cause cervical and mediastinal adenopathy. There is actually a um, Castleman disease network where um, it's usually treated with chemotherapy. So it's something that is not commonly seen and you may wanna find a center that specializes in that. Uh, neurofibroma, especially neurofibromatosis type one will present with multiple nodules. Sometimes they're subcutaneous and sometimes they're cutaneous um, and they can get quite large. And then post uh, transplant lymphoproliferative disease uh, can actually be treated as if it's a malignancy. It may present with uh, multiple enlarged cervical nodes, tonsillar hypertrophy, and adenoid hypertrophy. And then um, things like Langerhans cell histiocytosis. This is no way a comprehensive list. It's, it's, it's a generalized list that can really help you think through the option, uh, other possibilities of what might be going on. Um, again, we talk, we, we'll briefly talk about thyroid disease, but don't forget, kids can still have thyroid nodules. They may have a colloid nodule or a hemorrhagic nodule. In some cases, they'll have, uh, present with a non-functional goiter. That can be a family history of goiter um, and follicular adenomas. Um, it's less likely to see things like Hashimoto's or Graves, but again, those can also show up in children. So moving on to malignancy, lymphoma overall is the sixth most common cause of cancer, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is more common than Hodgkin's. There were about 64,000 cases diagnosed in 2005, and most of those, uh, around 7,400 of those were Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, so over the past 35 years, the incidence of lymphoma has doubled, and it is associated with Epstein-Barr virus, as well as Helicobacter. Um, FNA may be helpful, but most of the time people would want an excisional biopsy so they can do flow cytometry, um, and it's treated with chemotherapy and radiation. Hodgkin's lymphoma is a little bit more common in children. It's characterized by Reed Sternberg cells, and it spreads by nodal regions to solid organs, and there are four different types of patterns that are seen. And here you can see these Reed Sternberg cells. They're like these big, cells with these uh, clear nuclei here, and they look like a little orphan antii kind of things, wide, clear area, uh, areas, and then a dark nucleus here, and here's another one right there. Um, thyroid malig uh, malignancies, the most common in children is papillary. Uh, there is an 80 to 90% survival rate, and in children, it's almost 100%. Usually they present as multinodular and multicystic, just like they do in adults. They can be associated with autoimmune thyroid disease as well as prior radiation exposure. 
Medullary carcinoma has been reported in children, uh, generally older than age six, um, but it's associated with MAN syndrome, so that's something to bear in mind. They come from the parafollicular C cells and present with elevated calcitonin. Um, CEA levels can also be beneficial. Follicular carcinoma is much less common in children, and it can be associated with radiation exposure as well. Uh, and anaplastic carcinoma is generally not seen in children. And these are just some histopathologic slides that show the types of um, carcinoma. So here you can see follicular carcinoma, which has these atypical looking follicles. So here's some more normal looking follicles there and um, some vascular or capsular invasion here. Here these follicles look a little bit funny. Papillary carcinoma has these long strands or papillae with a little, very little colloid in there. Um, there's cellular atypia, like you can see here and here, and then multiple cystic spaces here. And these are usually filled with sort of like this thick fluid. And here you can see these cystic nodes from papillary carcinoma here. And that one is a, a solid node here. And then medullary carcinoma, like we said, comes from the parafollicular C uh, cells, and they look like little signet rings. So you can see one right here and right here and that one there. So it kind of looks a little bit like the cricoid. Um, they secrete calcitonin um, and in carcinoid type symptoms, they may produce like diarrhea or abdominal pain as well. So MEN syndromes, we'll briefly talk about here. Um, as you recall, MEN1 is associated with pituitary tumors, parathyroid adenomas, and pancreatic tumors. MEN2A and B have pheochromocytomas, medullary carcinoma, um, and then type 2A has hyperparathyroidism and type 2B has neurofibromas. Um, and there may be familial medullary thyroid carcinoma. And these are generally disorders of RET oncogene, which um, regulates tumor growth factor beta signaling system. Rhabdomyosarcoma is the most common childhood soft tissue malignancy, and it accounts for 3 to 4% of all pediatric cancers. Uh, it usually presents in the maxilla or the nasal pharynx, but you can see metastases in the neck. And if they arise in the orbit, then they're generally the embryonal type. They're divided by histologic types. The most likely head and neck one is the embryonal type, and it's arranged in these sheets and nests of small blue cells. I'll show you a photomicrograph of that. Um, the botryoid and spindle cell types tend to be more in the GU tract. And then the alveolar type tends to involve the extremities, but it can involve the maxilla or mandible as well. And they have these fibrovascular septi. This is associated with a FOX01 genetic rearrangement. About seven or eight, eight percent of these are associated with genetic syndromes including things that we will see, like Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome and neurofibromatosis type 1. There's actually a 20-time increased risk of them developing a rhabdomyosarcoma in NF1. NF1. So these are things that should be closely monitored. Uh, Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, as you probably recall, is associated with microglossia and Wilms tumors. Um, so we will frequently see these as babies with um, either airway obstruction or difficulty feeding or dysarthria related to uh, macroglossia. People will use MRIs and CT scans for staging. Um, PET scanning is uh, uncertain whether this really shows uh, much information because of the uptake. Lymph node biopsies are useful uh, for metastatic evaluation. It's a little less common in a head and neck primary, but it can be present. Uh, the primary might be small and in the nasopharynx, and they may present with a metastatic uh, neck node instead of the primary. And the prognosis is dependent on things like tumor stage, histologic type, and other genetic factors. And this micrograph just shows a classic um, embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, and this is arranged in these kind of nests here. You see these multiple darker blue cells scattered throughout. There's cellular atypia. There's um, not a lot of cytoplasm. The prognosis for children in the orbit is actually quite good. So this is um, the 
overall survival, and then the event-free survival or tumor-free survival. So overall survival is 85%, um, depending on which scale you're using. This is the um, International Pediatric Oncology Malignant Mesenchymal Tumor Study, lots to say. And then this is the intergroup rhabdomyosarcoma study group protocol. So survival is either ranges from 85 to 100 percent overall if it presents in the orbit. If it presents um, non-paramenangeal, there's a lower overall survival rate, 64 to 89 percent. And if it presents paramenangeal under age of three. Uh, there's a 59% survival rate or 64, so pretty poor survival rate. If it presents at three or older, the survival rate is slightly better, 65 to 78%. So these are not great to get, um, but these babies or children can, can survive it, and usually the treatment is multimodality. So in order to sort of triage your consults when, the, when you're getting called by the, the floor for a kid with a neck mask, if it's urgent, um, you know, it's causing airway obstruction, failure to thrive. If there's an acute infection that's not responding to antibiotics, if it's a rapidly enlarging mass, those need to be dealt with in patients. Sorry? Little mass. Not mass, um, for outpatient management, these are the majority. So nexus that are not causing airway obstruction. Draining pits or sinus tracts hemangiomas, lymphatic malformations, lymphadenopathies, you'll frequently get inpatient consults for some of these things. So most of the time, these things can be dealt with on an outpatient basis. So the biggest thing is to think through whether it's something that's likely to be congenital or acquired, where does it present, what are associated symptoms or factors, uh, does it change, what is, and then the timing of intervention. All right, any questions about all of that? <laughs> 